Forward Guidance is brought to you by VanEck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about VanEck ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Very pleased to speak once again with Liz Ann Saunders, Chief Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab. Liz Ann, wonderful to see you again. How are you? I'm doing great. Nice to see you again, too, Jack. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, Liz Ann, how are you thinking about this market? The, the rally that began very early in November has continued, and we are at a very, very high level in the market. How precedented is just how quickly the stock market is going up? Obviously, the stock market goes up all the time, but is it often that it goes up this quickly and with such ferociousness? Well, not necessarily, but I, I think to use the word ferocious would be an application to the index level of gains uh, year to date or since in the case of the S&P, the, the late October low. But um, I, I've been saying this market maybe could be better described as a as a duck <laughs> than a bull if we think about that that old Michael Caine phrase around calm on the surface, but kind of moving or churning like the Dickens underneath. And that's the reality of what's happened with the market this year. If you look at the index level, whether it's the S&P or the NASDAQ, we're, we're at or near all-time highs. You've had no more than a 2 or 3% maximum drawdown year to date at the index level. But as an example, in the case of the NASDAQ, the average member maximum decline from or maximum drawdown, to use the typical term, from year-to-date highs has actually been more than negative 20%. So that's that's bear market level declines under the surface. So I, I think you have to look under the surface to get not the true story, but the full story of what's going on. Just a lot of churn under the surface, but given these are cap weighted indexes and there's continues to be this dominance by some mega cap stocks that has made the indexes look like they're on fire, which they have been, but the, the real story or the full story is under the surface. So the real story under the surface is that a, a small number of, of stocks is driving the, the ferocious rally in the S&P 500. And how would you characterize those stocks that are going much higher and are, you know, are, are, are surging? Would it be by sector, by market cap? Yeah, by market cap. And it's not, it's not the same subset of stocks that dominated performance last year. We're, we're all probably now familiar with the Magnificent Seven. The, the moniker associated with the seven stocks that are embedded in that group were originally derived based on the seven largest stocks in the S&P 500 in the NASDAQ. But even those seven now do not define the seven largest uh, stocks. So Tesla has actually dropped out of the largest seven and has been leapfrogged by Berkshire Hathaway and interestingly by Eli Lilly. And even Broadcom has a couple of times in the last month or so leapfrogged uh, Tesla. And unlike last year, when those were the seven largest stocks, but they were also seven really strong performers, they were not the seven best performers, but they were, you only had to go down to the 63rd ranking of all the stocks in the S&P 500 to capture all seven of the stocks. Year to date this year, you've got to go down to the 493rd ranking to capture all seven of those stocks. Both Tesla and actually more recently Apple are in the ranking in the you know four to 500 position. So there's much more dispersion. Now, where performance has resided in terms of leadership has still been more dominated by capitalization than any one particular sector. So yes, it's still dominated by large caps, but it, there's just a more dispersion in, in terms of where that performance is coming from other than at the cap uh, level than was the case in 2023. When you say market cap, you're talking about size. So it really is the very large companies that are leading the S&P 500 higher. What can you say about previous historical periods where so much of the heavy lifting was done by the, the giants in the index and the uh, smaller companies were lagging behind? They're doing all right, but they're not doing nearly as well. When you, when you look at historical precedents, what kind of period does that tend to be? Well, unfortunately, some of the historical precedents do take you back to the 1999-2000 period, but they're 
are others as well that don't have the same kind of you know dire subsequent outcome like was the case heading into the early part of 2000. What what we've seen recently, and it is starting to improve, is not just that some large cap stocks were dominating performance and driving up the cap weighted indexes. That's not uncommon historically. It's often the case that in these cap weighted indexes, you've got performance driven by some smaller subset of stocks, be it uh, you know, the Nifty 50 or the top five or the top 10, or more recently, the Magnificent Seven, that's not uncommon. What What is uncommon, and again, improving recently, is how much the rest of the index has underperformed. So the the remaining 493 stocks, looking back over the past 12 months, you've seen significant underperformance relative to the the index. It's only 20 some odd percent of the overall S&P has outperformed the index over the trailing 12 month period. But that jumps up to more than 40% if you just look at what percentage of the index is outperforming over the past month. So under the surface, you're starting to see a little bit of broader participation, better news. The problem comes like was the case at the midpoint of last year. And I think it was one of the, the reasons for the correction that occurred in the S&P, in the NASDAQ, from the latter part of July to the latter part of October. Some of that was driven by the spike in yields, but I think it was also um, driven in part by just how dramatic the concentration was, but record-breaking underperformance of the rest of the index. So it's sort of the, the bookends problem. The concentration problem with a small handful of names and significant underperformance by the rest of the index. It's sort of that double whammy that becomes a problem. And that, I think, again, was was a precursor to the corrective phase we got uh, in the, call it the fall, the third quarter of last year. That is starting to improve, but I think more work needs to be done for breadth broadly to suggest we have a healthier backdrop for, for the equity market. Interesting. So you know, those parallels of 99 and 2000, they jump out. But interestingly, also last year, breadth was quite weak. And last year ha- was a great year for the stock market with, of course, some corrections. And th- this year is a great market now. But, but again, it's a great market at the index level. And mm-hmm. the reason why, and it's it's always unfortunate to use a battlefront analogy when you've got two wars uh, going on. But the the old analogy that has been used to describe breadth and concentration that I think is one that that people can visually understand is if you you only have a few generals on the front line, even if they're five-star generals, but you have had the soldiers retreat well back from the front lines, that's not a terribly strong front. Even if you have some of the generals retreating, but if you've got a lot of the soldiers that have come to the front line, that's a stronger front. In fact, what's interesting is to think back not to 1999-2000, but to October of 2022, sort of the ultimate low that launched the, the bull market that we're in right now. That was a point in time where the indexes, the S&P, the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ 100, we're actually taking out on the downside their prior June lows. So on the surface, it looked pretty ugly at the, those October lows. But under the surface, you had seen significant breadth improvement. There were was an increasing number of stocks that were reaching uh, you know, new short-term highs. You were seeing an increasing number of stocks trading above their moving averages, even though the indexes, which at that time were dragged down by some of the mega cap names, that was a positive divergence, as it's called technically. That's the kind of backdrop you want to see versus one, say, at the midpoint of last year, where you the indexes look great. They were being kept afloat or you know moving to new highs recently because of a small handful of names, but less participation under the surface. Again, improving recently, but I want to continue to see that to say, okay, now it really looks like a healthy market. So in terms of the stock prices, it is a handful of mostly large cap stocks that are leading the overall index to a very uh, high level. Well, when it comes to the earnings, 
how much of it, it also is, you know, the stocks that have gone up the most have seen their earnings go up. So, you know, I mean, one thinks of the, yeah. the stock definitely leading this, this market, N NVIDIA. In other words, it's not so much, oh, actually, the earnings are great. And the, the rally in these huge large cap stocks doesn't really make sense because their earnings are not going up more than the you know, average stock. Or is it, no, that they, they are. And, you know, most of the earnings improvement that you're seeing in the S&P 500 you know, also tell us about that is is also from the stocks that happen to be driving this market higher. No question about it. And that's the important differentiator between the current environment and say 1999 into early 2000 is there, there was a serious, what I've been calling a denominator problem back in the late 90s into early 2000, meaning there just wasn't a lot of E in the PE equation. You you had a lot of companies that that were not profitable. That certainly, with the benefit of hindsight, it, the short profitability was a pipe dream, <laughs> and very different from the current environment, where many of those names let let let's use the Magnificent Seven as as a group for for lack of a better group, and certainly they have been dominant in the past year. There's not a denominator problem, uh, you know, incredibly strong earnings profile. In fact, the for the fourth quarter that we're just concluding earnings reporting season for, talking about 60% earnings growth for that group of stocks. If you X just that group of seven stocks out of the S&P 500, you go down back down into negative territory for growth in the fourth quarter and year over year terms. You've also got significant cash flows and a high percentage of those cash flows being reinvested in particular in things like capital spending. So there's there's a lot of there there in that group of stocks. Now that doesn't mean they're not trading at very rich valuations. They are, but you could argue that if you're taking a factor-based approach, which is what we have been recommending, is screening for stocks, looking for stocks that have certain factors or characteristics like strong cash flow and strong earnings trends and um, high interest coverage. They don't have to worry about you know, rolling over uh, corporate debt and paying higher interest rates on that debt. Those stocks, for the most part, screen really well on those factors, on those characteristics, and that helps to explain their their dominance. Again, doesn't mean there is an evaluation problem, and that that sets up the possibility of some disappointment if the bar keeps getting set higher and higher in terms of expectations for this company. But absent those companies, the earnings profile for the overall index, like the S and P, doesn't look anywhere near as healthy as it does, courtesy of those names. Thanks. And what what do those numbers look like in terms of you know how much earnings for per per the the S and P five hundred and are the estimates of for twenty twenty four and twenty twenty five are they rising a lot? The numbers are going to vary, but in general, you're looking at close to a, a double digit, call it high single digit, low double digit expectation for year over year gains in twenty twenty four relative to twenty twenty three, and about the same for 2025 over 2024. The only thing I'd say about that is those estimates are just not realistic. And I don't mean by not realistic, I don't mean they're too high and have to come down. I mean, literally not realistic in the sense that they're not based on concrete data that analysts are getting from companies where they can have sort of, you know, an intelligent set of inputs that go into the quarterly assumptions they have for this year and for next year. One of the things that has happened throughout the course of this pandemic is that, particularly in the early part of the pandemic, a record percentage of companies withdrew guidance altogether. They just said, we're not going to try to provide quarterly guidance to the analysts covering our companies because of the massive and unique uncertainty associated with the pandemic. It's not as bad as it was a couple of years ago. But there's still not quite the same kind of precision in guidance has been the case in the past. Frankly, Jack, I think some companies may be, I don't want to say using as an excuse, but taking advantage, for lack of a better way to describe it, of the unique uncertainty associated with the pandemic and other uncertainties to move away from the kind of precise quarterly guidance. Uh, most companies just, they'll often admit that that's not how they run their businesses. That's just the nature of Wall Street and earnings estimates. But I think what's happened is analysts 
are adjusting earnings in nearer term. They, they'll wait for earnings season. They've adjusted, you know, an estimate or estimates for their companies heading into earnings season. And they make, you know, tweaks to it as earnings season progresses. And then based on the outlooks they're hearing from the companies they follow, they might adjust one quarter out or two quarters out to those consensus estimates. Fourth quarter 2025 estimates are just not really grounded in a lot of concrete information. So I think those will continue to be a moving target. And it does make forward valuation analysis maybe a little bit murkier because the plug, the denominator is just maybe not as certain as, or at least it was perceived to be in the past. So you're saying that fourth quarter 2025 we don't know. The analysts don't know. It is it is an unknowable number. But are you right. saying that it's more unknowable than it was in you know 2018? The the fourth quarter 2019 numbers are, and that's because companies are withdrawing guidance. I I, I had no idea. I think on the margin it's less noble. Not to mention that the macro backdrop is just more uncertain in in an environment like this. Um, maybe less so these days because of pandemic impacts. Hopefully we we continue to put that in the rearview mirror, but. I just think that the macro backdrop has changed quite a bit. There is more geopolitical instability. We've got two wars going on. There's much more monetary policy instability. We're in this transition from the most aggressive tightening cycle in more than 40 years. We're in the pause period. We, we The grave uncertainty with regard to when the easing cycle begins because of trying to combat this 40-year high in inflation so I think that there are so many forces at play right now, you know, globalization, and, and I, I don't want to say deglobalization, but this is where the pandemic still comes into play, the shift toward just-in-case inventory management from just-in-time inventory management and more supply chain diversification. We've got demographics around the world that are dramatically different relative to even you know five or six years ago. Um, and then just inflation volatility and more economic volatility. I, I think all of those factors makes you know an estimate two years from now or almost two years from now just you know fraught with uncertainty. And what is, because you mentioned macro, what is your read of the economic situation? Let's stick with the, the U.S. for now. So we have used the, the term rolling recessions to describe this uh, cycle. And, and sometimes I get criticized for that term, which, you know, fine, I don't care. <laughs> then come up with another term, but it's probably the most accurate way to describe what has actually happened. It, it's not a, a, a an opinion. It, it's what's actually happened. And not that any of us want to live the last three and a half years, but if you go back to the heart of the stimulus era of the early part of the pandemic, you know, $5 trillion of stimulus over the course of, of a few quarters, of course, that boosted demand and in turn the economy and pulled it out of the short-lived but extraordinarily painful COVID recession. But in that early phase, all that demand and the spending associated with it was funneled almost solely into the good side of the economy because we had no access to services. That's also where the inflation problem began very much on the good side of inflation metrics. But fast forward to the more recent period, we, we've we gone into individual recessions for many of those segments of the economy that were big beneficiaries of the early stimulus uh, phase of the recovery. So manufacturing, housing, housing related, a lot of consumer oriented goods and products. Same thing has happened on the inflation front. You went from serious goods inflation, hyperinflation in some categories to disinflation to outright deflation in some categories. We've just then shifted to a later pickup in growth on the services side to a later pickup in inflation on the in the services categories. So we've had this roll through. What happened in terms of where the recessions resided was not sufficient enough and not broad based enough for it to be declared an official recession by the NBER. We did have two quarters in a row of negative GDP in 2022. That's not the definition of a recession. That's not why I mention it. But we we saw weakness in the overall economy with negative GDP, negative GDP, two quarters. It just wasn't broad-based, which is the key part of the NBER definition. So now when I think, okay, here we are now, services has, has some cracks starting to show, but, but still doing fairly well. And now we may be starting to see some attempt at recovery 
in areas that have already had their hard landing. So to me, when I think about the future, an ideal scenario is rolling recessions turn into rolling recoveries. It might generically be termed a soft landing, but I'm not sure that's the best way to describe it because we've had hard landings in those aforementioned uh, areas. It just wasn't enough to pull the economy more broadly down with it. So in a pre-COVID economic era, if one industry entered a recession, in other words, it was laying people off and demand was going down, production was going down, it was more likely that another industry and broadly the entire economy would enter a general recession. Now you're saying in 2022, you didn't mention them, but I, I imagine you're referring to things like shipping or trucking, uh, maybe chemicals, like very cyclical business definitely had a very hard time in 2022, but the economy did not enter a recession. And it was, uh, if anything, actually the services and spending and, and travel and going to restaurants, that more than filled in the gap from those right. from those industries. Not only that, but services is a much larger employer in the United States, helping to explain the resilience of the labor market. There, there's so many things about this cycle that have been unique, in, including um, labor market uh, trends. You know, we have, we have seen really the mirror image of what normally happens when you go through some sort of economic slowdown, uh, a contraction, a hard landing, a recession, a soft landing, but some sort of contraction in economic growth. And, you know, what we saw this time it, in, in the segment or the time frame associated with these rolling recessions, like I said, manufacturing and housing and housing related, a lot of the, the layoffs earlier in this cycle were top down in nature um, within segments like technology and financials. Top down meaning in a normal downturn in the economy or slowdown in the economy, um, what companies tend to do when deciding to lay off workers, it tends to be more bottom up. It's lower income workers, lower wage workers, and it takes a while to move up to sort of the managerial class, the supervisory class. This time it was sort of flipped on its head. And the, the bigger, more abundant layoffs came from the top down, um, particularly in areas like tech and financial. So it was up the managerial supervisory spectrum. It was up the income spectrum. That was unique in this environment. It helps to explain why we didn't see the commensurate significant shoot up in things like unemployment claims, because many of those folks get severance, which means they're not eligible, or they got other jobs fairly quickly, or if they felt that there was a stigma associated with it, or they had enough uh, of, a, of a sort of backstop that they didn't need to quickly file for unemployment insurance. So it's just an example of so much that has been unique about this cycle. And this is sort of one big orange <laughs> compared to history's apples in terms of what this cycle has looked like, both you know, on the downside in the case of the COVID recession and what has happened in the aftermath of that. Like gold did, Bitcoin is establishing itself as a macro asset that potentially helps hedge against the government devaluation of your money. Finally, you can easily access Bitcoin in a low cost ETF with the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today. Visit vanek.com slash HODLFG to learn more. That's vanek.com slash HODLFG. Now the disclosures. Investing involves risk and you can lose money on an investment in the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL. The value of Bitcoin and therefore the value of the trust shares could decline rapidly, including to zero. You could lose your entire principal investment. For a more complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. Do you have a theory as to why you know the economic cycle is no longer an apple? It it is an orange, uh, but and of course you know people not watching this, the the color of four guns is uh, is orange. Uh, so some people throw out fiscal stimulus, in other words, you know the U.S. government running a, a large government deficit. To what degree do you think that is responsible, or do you have other explanations? Well, I think certainly the 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 massive stimulus associated with the pandemic uh, is is sort of the primary component of that, and the pandemic itself. You know, I, I went back to the stimulus phase to talk about the demand surge and the growth surge concentrated in goods. That's not happened in the past. When we've had via stimulus, uh, you know, a pickup in growth, when, when the monetary authorities step in or fiscal authorities step in and they're trying to pull an economy out of recession and you get that stimulus, again, both monetary and fiscal, it's often spread throughout the economy. But we had the unique circumstance of it 
being funneled into just the good side of the economy because services were shut down. And so that's the different segments at different times component that makes this, you know, an apple compared to history's oranges or vice versa, whatever, you know, color comparison you want to do. So I think it's it's the pandemic really specifically, not some unique aspect to the stimulus. It's the the size of the stimulus, but the fact that when that stimulus went into the economy, it was funneled into just the good side of the economy. And that's what makes this a particularly unique cycle. The roll through and the hits and the, the benefits accruing to different segments of the economy at different times. Now let's talk about the, the Federal Reserve and what it uh, means for, for stocks. I think a, a lot of folks do a back test of a the last time you know when the, the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates and they show on average, the S&P 500 returns a certain amount. I'm not familiar with the, the data. And I guess that's kind of a back test. I mean, that similar thinking to when I asked you the question mm-hmm. about uh, what's the, you know, a similar time the market has had such narrow breadth led by very large cap stocks. When people talk about an average cutting cycle for, for Federal Reserve, what mistakes would do that? Does that make sense to you? Or, or, or what, what, yeah, what are people missing there? I happen to have a really handy little table here that I might reference. Um, It's all about historic rate cycles um, through the entire cycle. So the the hiking part of the cycle, then arguably the pause part of the cycle, the, the one where we are right now, the period in between whatever the final hike is and the first cut, and then the period once the Fed has started uh, cutting. So I, I like the way you asked the question with regard to does the average tell us anything? And the short answer is not really. Um, And here's why. If you look at full Fed cycles, so a period where you had a hiking cycle, then they they ended the hiking cycle for some period of time, and then ultimately they moved to cutting rates and you had a cutting cycle. Those are full cycles. There have only been 14 of them historically, not including the one we're in right now, because we're not fully through this one. We've had the hiking part. We're in the pause mode. We haven't started the cutting part. So 14 prior cycles. That's not a a large sample size. Now, I can tell you, and I'll pick up my little cheat sheet here. If you look at the pause period, the period in between the final hike and the first cut, I can tell you that the average in terms of what the market has done is 1.4%. That may seem like the market doesn't do much in the pause period, but here's the big rub. First of all, in terms of how long those pause periods have lasted, as little as 58 days in the late 1950s, and as long as 874 days in the early 1990s. So the average is 230 days, but when you have a range of 58 to 874, the average is somewhat meaningless. <laughs> now it gets even more interesting when you look at performance during the pause period, because the average, again, is 1.4%. That would suggest on average, the market just kind of hangs around, doesn't do much. The range is minus 27% to plus 26%, with seven positive outcomes and seven negative outcomes. So shame on anyone that cites the average and, and uses a word like typical which I see all the time. So typically the market does. And I think when you have a small sample size with a huge range of outcomes and 50% of them are up and 50% of them are down and the range goes from minus 27% to plus 26%, almost by definition, the average doesn't look like any of the individual circumstances. And it's the extremes that are important because it's the why behind what was happening. You know. Was the Fed moving quickly? Were they moving slowly? What's the why behind if they were moving quickly? Were they trying to pull an economy out of recession? So it's the details around. Now, when you move to the point they start cutting, the numbers get a little bit more biased on the positive side of the the ledger. In the case of six months following the initial rate cut, you have only three negative outcomes out of those 14 you still have a a pretty significant range. The range goes from as much as a 39% gain six months after the first cut to a 12% loss. And interestingly, if you go a year after the first cut, 
There's only two losses, but one of the two is the same period as you had the loss after six months. 12 months later, you lost again. And that was the point uh, that started in 2006. Because the reason why the Fed was cutting was the global financial crisis. Uh, I don't have to remind anybody that that was not a great backdrop for the equity market. The best performance 12 months after the Fed started uh, cutting rates was actually back in the 50s. The best performance for the market six months after the Fed started cutting rates was in 1974. The pain had already occurred because of the brutal 73, 74. We finally got that out of the way in terms of the market. Once the Fed started cutting, the market did very well, but it was coming off of a really brutal period. So I could go on and on with individual examples of this, but Again, I'd go back to sort of shame on anyone that says, well, typically the market does and fills in the blank with some sort of uh, average because, you know, when you have a small sample size and a wide range, it brings up the old adage around analysis of an average can lead to average analysis. So there's almost zero signal in terms of the absolute return during a holding pattern when the peak in interest rates has been reached during a cycle, but the Federal Reserve hasn't cut yet. There is a mildly or somewhat positive reading for when the Federal Reserve actually cuts. But in both instances, there is a huge variability that causes the, the phrase a typical cutting cycle to be almost ridiculous. I mean, you, if you have an average of you know, a 10% gain, but it's either 50% or negative 40%, negative 30%, that, that is uh, not very meaningful at all. Is there a signal, though, in, in maybe that it seems like the the fact that the divergence is so wide that there is it is so atypical that it is kind of the the end of an economic cycle where you either begin anew and growth explodes higher and oh actually the federal reserve only needs to cut two, two or three times like in the late 1990s or interest rates are way too high and actually there's going to be a giant global recession so you, that's a great way to 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 think about the point at which the Fed starts cutting. If you want to take those 14 examples and not look individually and look at the range from best outcome to worst outcome, but try to generally categorize, all right, was there sort of a theme around times where the market did better when the Fed was cutting versus worse when the Fed was cutting? And one thing you can do is look at slower cutting cycles versus fatter, faster cutting cycles. And even though it seems these days when you listen to the chatter that the market has been hoping for a more aggressive Fed, sooner, more, more uh, rate cuts, that historically is not the better outcome. Um, slower cutting cycles tend to be accompanied by better market performance than faster cycles. And it's intuitive in the sense that if they're cutting aggressively, it's probably because they're trying to pull the economy out of a recession. The way to think about the Fed in this cycle that is maybe not a differentiator relative to every past cycle, but maybe a differentiator relative to what more often than not you see. And there's the, the again, the old adage of the Fed usually takes the escalator up and the elevator down meaning they tend to be a bit more methodical and slower when they're hiking rates for obvious reasons. It has a deleterious impact on the economy. They want to be careful. That's normally the way they approach uh, the hiking part of a cycle. Very different this time because they were, first of all, late to the, the game. Uh, inflation kind of got out of hand, and they concede that now. That's not me being an armchair quarterback and a, and a Fed basher, you know, Powell himself will say, yeah, we probably stayed at the zero bound a bit too long. So they clearly took the elevator up this time, not simply because they want to do the opposite on the way down, but I think in the interest of making sure that inflation doesn't reignite at the point they start cutting, like happened twice in the 1970s, I think this is an environment where when all is said and done, we'll look back and say, well, they definitely took the elevator up and they probably, it looks like they took the escalator down. So it's just kind of a visual way to think about it. And does the pricing in the, the, the I guess, short-term interest rate market, the fact that the you know, rapid interest rate cutting cycle that was priced in, in December has been moved out and out. And a few months ago, if we were speaking, it would have been a, a coin toss priced by the market about whether the Federal Reserve priced in March and now the market is pricing that it's more likely than not, as we record this so you know, the afternoon of March 4th, that the Federal Reserve 
won't cut in May or, or even uh, June, maybe. Does that you know, offer a cautiously bullish note that this could be like the late 1990s because there won't need to be that many cuts? Yeah. In fact, you know, even before the most recent hotter than expected CPI inflation report and better than expected January jobs report, we were not of the view that March was the start point. We felt that the market had gotten way over its skis in not just assuming such an early start to rate cuts, but as many as six cuts happening. That just didn't make a lot of sense based on the data. Inflation wasn't at or near the Fed's target. You didn't have enough loosening in the labor market, which is another key ingredient that the Fed itself has cited as important in in bringing in inflation down and keeping it, that uh, you, it just you, you certainly didn't have it in terms of of the labor market, in terms of overall economic growth. So we felt that that made very little sense. And then, courtesy of those two subsequent reports, not to mention what Powell specifically said at the press conference associated with the most recent Fed meeting and in subsequent commentary, had to pretty aggressively push back on a, a March start point. And now, since then the market has moved closer to where the Fed has been. And by has been, it's not, they're not on a predetermined course. And that's a very important fact. But where the so-called dots plots, their collective uh, uh, judgments of where the Fed funds rate is going to be at the end of the year. Now the market is sort of caught down to where the, the Fed has been. But the Fed is data dependent right now. They're not on a predetermined course, which means the whole notion of what are the probabilities for the May meeting, what are the probabilities for the June meeting, how many cuts are priced in, that is literally an everyday moving target um, as data comes in, particularly inflation and labor market data, which of course is what's tied to the Fed's dual mandate of full employment and price stability. So every day those prospects could change based on the information that we uh, get. The Fed is, again, not on a predetermined path. They're, they don't in their minds know what they're going to do and they're just waiting for an appropriate time to drip out that information to us lowly, you know, Fed watchers. Um, they're watching the data just like the rest of us. I know, you know, you said it's it's best to focus on the dispersion in the market, what's leading this market by market cap, not by by sector. And I, I like that because there are so many companies that you know most of us would consider tech companies that are in the communication sector they're not in tech and you know apple i believe is a tech stock but of course i mean it could be a consumer staple because so many people have them and so the the sector not uh, denomination is very arbitrary but if i were to you know sort of uh, propose to you the the broad theme of ai and if i were to say you know is it the case that a lot of the stocks that are leading this market whether regardless of market cap size the market either correctly or incorrectly perceives them to be beneficiaries of the rise of, of artificial intelligence. How true is it that AI is really you know, leading this market forward as a theme? And are you a broad proponent, a believer in artificial intelligence, or are you somewhat of a, of a skeptic of, a, of its potential or how long it may take to improve productivity and earnings and the like? Well, I'm not a skeptic. I am a believer. But in terms of the, the concrete improvement of productivity that could directly uh, align back to AI, I think that's a longer term phenomenon, not a short term phenomenon. Now, you know, with, with any increase in productivity data, there's going to be a lot of folks that might tie it to AI more directly or say it's not. So that that's where there's there's a bit more of a qualitative assessment that comes into play. But I'm a I'm a big believer. I think though that in terms of a driver of performance, it very much sat behind why the Magnificent Seven specifically did so well last year, not only with NVIDIA, obviously, as a, as a leader, but the fact that, you know, four of the other six stocks besides NVIDIA within the Magnificent Seven represent more than 40% of NVIDIA's client base or customer base. So there, there is that interconnectivity. I mean, Jack, you're right to point out that the Magnificent Seven actually spans three different sectors tech communication services and consumer discretionary. So it's more than just tech. We, we think often generically about tech as sort of anything tech, tech related, techy in nature. But, but this year, really actually since the, the lows last year, you've seen better performance and almost these breakouts in sectors like industrials. You've seen it in financials. And so I think there's sort of more to the market story now than just AI. I also think the shift 
that is underway is not away from who's at the heart of AI on, on sort of the infrastructure, the production side of the chips, but how, how are companies using AI? And that question and the answers to those questions, which you hear about a lot and read about a lot during earnings season, because that's when you get commentary most directly from companies, that's across the spectrum of sectors and industries. You, you, you can't get off a conference call, regardless of what type of company it is, where questions aren't asked about, okay, how are you using AI to boost productivity or enhance efficiency or to move into new product or whatever it is. So I think we're starting to see the story around AI be at least as much about how is it being adopted um, across, again, across the spectrum of industries and sectors and, and less about just who, who's at the heart of the infrastructure associated with this. I, I imagine that during a technological innovation cycle, it is typical for companies to see dramatic growth in their earnings. But I mean, when you, when you think of NVIDIA, which has you know, more than doubled its, its revenue one year over one year, you know, maybe you see that in an oil company and the price of oil went from negative to 120, like, okay, that makes sense. But that, I mean, how common is it for a company that of that size to double its, its revenues in a, in a year? Not very common. And, you know, a very important caveat as we start to, as, as individual names are mentioned here, mm-hmm. I am not an analyst. I don't cover any individual stocks. I don't own individual stocks directly um, other than what might be in, you know, index funds or mutual funds that I have. I don't trade uh, stocks. Again, I don't cover them. But um, the kind of exponential growth we're seeing in stocks like that, in companies like that, tied to what has been much faster adoption rates. For as an example, I think uh, ChatGPT went to 100 million users in less than two months. And um, you know, past innovations like that, whether it's things like you know TikTok, it was measured in years getting to 100 million users as opposed to weeks. And so, not that you can apples to apples apply that to things like revenue growth in perpetuity, but that helps to explain why these are such eye-popping increases. Now, you know, I, I will say, and this is not from the perspective of an analyst and saying, you know, this is getting too sort of lopsided on the side of optimism, but, and I would say this more broadly about markets, when you when you start to have these sort of eye-popping actual results that then translate into similarly eye-popping forward extrapolations, that could continue. It could continue for a long time, maybe forever. <laughs> but it in a in a stretched sentiment environment where you've got stretched valuation, it does set up the possibility of disappointment. Even if in level terms, in absolute terms, the numbers still look absolutely fantastic. In this business we're in, relative often matters more than absolute. Better or worse often matters more than good or bad. So it's just something to to keep in mind, especially in a concentrated market. Sorry to interrupt. Just want to tell you about BlockWorks upcoming crypto symposium in London, the Digital Asset Summit, which is running from March 18th to March 20th. Everyone in crypto is going to be there, not just the experts and policymakers, but the real industry leaders writing the checks. Over $800 billion in assets is going to be represented. Anyone who's anyone in crypto is going to be there. So if you're into crypto and you haven't bought your ticket yet, the time is now to get your ticket. I would not wait any longer. We've got some exciting guests on the macro side too. Julian Brigden, Michael Howell. And yes, I can confirm at last the rumors are true. Joseph Wang, the Fed guy himself, is going to be there too. I'll be hosting a panel with these macro heavyweights that you don't want to miss. So be there or be square. Click the link in the description and use code FG10 to get 10% off. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. Tell us about quality as, as a factor. Why do you think quality has performed so so well? How, how do you define it? And is there something about quality right now as we you know sit here in, in early March 2024 that you think it will pre- continue to perform so well as opposed to any, any other time in your career? Or is it, you know, you just think you're secularly long quality as a factor? Well, I think it's it's right to be secularly long uh, quality, and that may that may make a lot of sense. Why why would why would you not want to invest in high quality companies relative to low quality companies? But um, there can certainly be shorter term opportunities where you have 
and I don't mean leverage in a debt sense, but I mean it more in a generic, there's sort of leverage to a big pickup in economic growth that could come down the quality spectrum, whether it's companies that were no longer profitable that have the possibility of becoming profitable again, or if you're in a declining interest rate environment, companies that were really hit by the move up in interest rates get that tailwind uh, from the decline in interest rates. So there are times where more from a tactical or cyclical perspective, it might be worth sacrificing quality. I don't think we're at that point yet in the cycle. And when we think of quality in terms of a factor, it's more a descriptor of several different factors that we've been emphasizing more so than one particular Factor. So the quality wrapper that we think of around factors include factors like high free cash flow, um, ample interest coverage, positive earnings revisions, positive earnings surprises. It's sort of a function of looking at the macro backdrop and seeing sort of what's, what's lacking or what's missing or, or where the problem spots are. It ties back to those factors that you want to emphasize, interest coverage being an example where you've, you've been, been in this rising interest rate environment, you've got a lot of corporate debt coming due, especially for less well-capitalized companies, in many cases down the cap spectrum, zombie type companies, companies don't, that don't have sufficient cash flow to pay the current interest on their debt, let alone debt that has to be rolled over to um, higher interest rates. Those factors, emphasizing those seem to make sense. Lower volatility as opposed to higher volatility. So that's what we've been emphasizing. Now, the, the best factor so far this year has actually been momentum. Now, momentum, though, it's, it's a perfect opportunity to explain the difference between, at times, preconceived notion of what a word means and what the word actually means. So a lot of times when you hear momentum's doing well, you think, oh, the high momentum stocks, that means tech stocks or high beta stocks. All the factor of momentum means is that stocks that have been doing well continue to do well. You can have momentum in energy stocks. You can have momentum in utility stocks. I'm not saying that's where the momentum has been, but I'm using it as an example of what we think of when we hear the word momentum, but what the word actually means. It's a characteristic of what is performing well in the market. It's the stuff that has been performing well, but that's not predetermined to be technology or communication services. It's just a factor. That's an important uh, distinction uh, when you look at where factor performances reside. The other thing I'd say is that there's been more consistency over history, but particularly in the last couple of years, in terms of where performance has been strongest, where performance has been weakest. There's been more consistency when you look at factor-based performance versus things like sector-based performance. You know, examples would be tech has had months where it's at the top of the leaderboard, the bottom of the leaderboard, and it's often, you know, energy is in the opposite position, lots of bouncing around in terms of weekly or monthly performance. But things like momentum or strong free cash flow or high interest coverage, stocks that screen well on those sort of quality-oriented factors have had more consistent outperformance than if you just look at sector type performance. Because within any sector, you can have high quality stocks and you can have low quality stocks. Going at the factor level sort of weeds out the lower quality. Stocks that would have high momentum in 2022 or some periods of 2022 likely would have been you know, some stocks in the energy sector, whereas now that they may be in the, the tech sector. But also industrials. You know, industrials ha have a really great overall profile breadth has been improving significantly. So that's where there's been a lot of momentum has been in industrials, not necessarily a sector that if you just said, what do you think of when you hear the word momentum? Right. And so how is momentum as a factor doing? Well, you, you said momentum as a factor is doing really well this year. How, how can we interpret that? What, what conclusions can we draw from, from that? The stocks, if you look at year to date performance, there's been uh, sort of this momentum factor, meaning there's not been a lot of chopping around. Stocks that have been performing well have continued to perform well. There's been momentum, but you're not just finding them in the areas that we might generically think of as representing momentum. Now, last year, momentum was clearly in the growth trio, 
of tech and communication services and consumer discretionary because they housed the Magnificent Seven and that's where the momentum was. Now momentum as a factor is doing well, but it's also because stocks that are doing well, which have been stocks that have been doing well and continue to do well, are also found in other sectors besides those. Industrials as an example of that. But the industrial sectors has, has one of the best breadth profiles. You know, percentage of stocks trading above, you know, 50 day moving average, 200 day moving average. Um, again, not necessarily what one would, might think of if they think generically about what momentum means in their own minds. So you really like quality as a factor. Sounds like you, you know, have some regard for momentum as a factor. What about uh, the other two value, how expensive or, or cheap a security is or a basket is? And uh, size, which is you know large cap. With the benefit of hindsight, we know large cap has been leading the day. But what about going forward? I think there's opportunities down the cap spectrum. But to say, do you like or don't like small cap? I think is almost nonsensical. You know, yeah. just just using the Russell 2000 as an example, it, it doesn't have 2,000 stocks in it. I think it has I don't know 1,850. I'm I'm totally guessing it's somewhere in that range, 1,800 and change. But that's a large <laughs> collection of stocks. And to say, I like small caps or I don't like small caps, yes, you, maybe you can make that call or not make that call if you're a purely a passive index investor and you're saying yay or nay to an index like that. But there is such a wide range in an index at large in terms of whether you're a low quality stock or a high quality stock on metrics like strong free cash flow and earnings prospects. So I, I think you you still have to do a lot of that screening work. Now, the one kind of tip, and I don't, I don't give tips in a traditional sense, but I, I would say that a lot of people don't realize that although the Russell 2000 is the most common benchmark used to represent small cap, it's not the only small cap index out there. S&P also has a small cap index. We're all familiar with the S&P 500, but the S&P also has the S&P 600, which is their version of small caps. It's obviously a smaller number of stocks. It has about 600 stocks in it, but S&P uses a profitability filter. Russell 2000 does not use a profitability filter. This is not me saying, so buy an S&P 600 index fund. It's just, if you think of indexes less about what I want to index to, but more about, okay, as a source for you know, opportunities or is just a source for, for names, um, you've got a much higher quality profile associated with the S&P 600 because it uses that profitability filter. And as a result, given that somewhere between 30 and 40% of the Russell 2000 is some combination of zombie companies, meaning they don't have sufficient cash flow to pay interest on their debt and or non-profitable companies. Um, the S&P has a much lower share there. And as a result of the difference in the denominator, the E in the PE, last I looked, and I, my, my numbers might be a week or so out of date, but the Russell 2000 was trading at, I think, 23 times forward earnings. The S&P 600 was trading at 14 times forward earnings because it has a much better denominator profile. Now, you asked specifically about value. Things like you know, strength of balance sheet, strong free cash flow, those are arguably more value oriented factors or characteristics. They're not just a traditional look for low PE, but I think it's a better way to measure value. You know, one of the problems with the categorization of growth versus value is it's easy to categorize a growth stock. You look for a certain threshold of, of earnings growth. Um, and that's what's going to put you in, whether it's an S&P growth index or a Russell growth index. The problem with value is that if you don't meet the parameters of a growth index, there's no other place to go except value. But you can be an expensive stock that lives in the value indexes simply because you don't have the growth profile to put you in the growth indexes. So just because you live in a value index doesn't mean you offer value. It just means you don't have growth. So there used to be the the acronym, if you remember, you know, years ago, GARP, growth at a reasonable price was sort of all the rage. I almost think today's version of that is, you know, corp, you know, quality at a reasonable price. So I do think you want to have a value mindset, avoid the landmines of absurd valuations or no profitability. Um, but you, uh, you want to have it part of sort of this overall quality wrapper. 
Very interesting. So like, let's imagine a company that has a price to earnings ratio of 50. So it's not cheap, but it's also has a growth rate of 1%. So it's not growing. So you're saying that it, that's more likely to be in a value index than a growth index. If it doesn't meet the growth uh, parameters. Um, you know, what's interesting is, is Russell, Russell and S&P do their growth and value indexes um, differently from one another. So Russell has four, S&P has four. Russell though has their Russell 1000 growth, Russell 2000 growth, Russell 1000 value, 2000 value. So basically it's large growth, small growth, large value, small value. S&P does it a little bit differently. They have the S&P pure growth index, which are stocks that do not overlap into value. Then they have their regular S&P growth. You can, you can be a stock in both S&P growth and S&P value. But if you're in S&P pure growth, you're not also in value. If you're in S&P pure value, you're not also in growth. So that's another important thing to remember. Um, and what's really interesting about that is back at the very end of 2022, which is when S&P does its annual rebalancing, they rejigger their growth and value indexes based on what characteristics they're displaying at the time. Uh, December 19th specifically was the rebalancing date of 2022. So we're now talking, you know, 14 months ago. Um, here's the fascinating thing that happened at that time and really helps to illustrate why even if you're an index investor, you better understand what you're buying. So on December 18th of 2022, all eight of the, what we were calling the magnificent or the grade eight at the time, um, I think Netflix was sort of in the mix and it, adding to the Magnificent Seven as we now know it. All eight were in the S&P Pure Growth Index. Um, on December, and tech, even though that wasn't the sector representing all of them, it represented a decent chunk of them, tech was 37% of the S&P Pure Growth Index. On December 19th, only one of the grade eight was still in pure growth. The other seven moved into some combination of regular growth and regular value. And partly as a result of that, technology went from being 37% of S&P pure growth to only 13% of S&P pure growth. And the two sectors that leapfrog tech to become the number one and number two weighted sectors in pure growth were energy and healthcare. Now, Russell doesn't do its rebalancing until June every year. By June of last year, June of 2023, when they did their rebalancing, energy didn't have the strong growth profile anymore. Healthcare didn't have it. So when they did their rebalancing, things didn't change that much. But S&Ps was rebalanced in December and stayed that way for the full year. So at one point last year, you had like a 25 percentage point difference between how S&P pure growth was performing and how Russell 1000 growth was performing. You think... They're both large cap growth indexes. Well, it has to do with what the characteristics were at the time that each of them rebalanced. So it's now an example that's a little dated. And when they did their this past December rebalancing, it shifted back more toward Russell because energy no longer had the kind of growth prospects that it had had 14 months ago when energy's earnings were on fire. So it's it's a detailed kind of answer, but I think it's so important because of how many people sort of miss the nuances of what do you mean by growth and value? Yeah, that is fascinating. And, you know, you really do have to own, uh, uh, know what you own. So an investor who, as yep. ChatGPT was coming out, said, oh, I'm going to buy a pure growth index. They're buying a bunch of energy stocks whose, you know, right, exactly. <laughs> did not grow, grow at all. That, that's fascinating. Um, Lizanne, thank you so much for joining us. People can My find pleasure. me on Twitter at Liz Ann Saunders uh, and at Schwab.com. And thanks everyone for watching. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. A reminder that Forward Guidance episodes are available on all podcast apps and on Twitter, where I post them regularly at JackFarley96. Thanks again. Until next time.